Most people have lots of shit you don't know about. People have lost parents traumatically at a young age. People you wouldn't expect have been emotionally or sexually abused. Adults who seem to have it all together are being bullied every single day at work. Women who can hold space and articulate their final arguments as litigators in an unrivaled capacity in their career may have had a miscarriage that morning. We really don't know what happens behind closed doors of those around us. I'm sharing this because I want to start to normalize the fact that life is hard. This is Impact, the podcast where we explore entrepreneurship, mindset, and health to provide you with the ingredients for an unregrettable version of your life story. Welcome to the Impact Podcast. We're hanging out today. Just you and I, and we are on the brink of a new series within Impact where we're talking all about resilience, how we build it in our own lives, how we can build it in others. And I know you've had the opportunity to hear from Natalie Jill. And and last week I was speaking with the amazing and beautiful Asha Frost. But I wanted to jump in here. I wanted to have a go at this conversation around resilience and why it's so important to me. You know, if you've been hanging out on the podcast on on impact or on anthropology, you know that I I do talk about this idea of resilience a lot. I, if I have a guest where they have an area of expertise in resilience or experience with resilience, I ask them about the tools and the mechanisms and the experience that they acquired in their lifetime to build resilience for themselves or if their expertise allows how they build resilience in others. I'm curious about this and I and I sort of refer to it, but I'm going to go into it today. I talk about it because I feel like I'm a fairly resilient person. Not perfect. Fall apart when I need to ball my eyes out when it is a appropriate overreact unnecessarily, probably more frequently than I would want to. Like these are all just real life things. But I also know in the face of total crisis, like I have, I really do have a confidence in myself that I can figure it out and find a solution and and hold space for those around me. I got really curious as to how that developed. I didn't want to. I didn't want to dismiss it as, oh, it's just how I am. It was how I how I was born. I certainly had a predisposition to being able to think that way, but I also had a series of life experiences that facilitated that for me. I'm going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about some of the challenges I had growing up and how that enabled me to build this resilience muscle. And I'm going to talk about that because one of the questions my husband and I frequently encounter as parents is how do we build resilience in our own children without giving them access, giving them access to trauma and real hardship, like really hard stuff that they're going to be unpacking and managing for years. How do we do that? And I'm starting to have some insight around that. And I'm hoping the insight is solidified before my kids are out, moved out and, and need to exercise this, this muscle. What I realized in my insight is that this is going to be a hard journey. And so I want to talk about this notion of resilience, and I want to speak to it in the context of legacy, because I actually believe that there is an opportunity for legacy and resilience to be passed down, that these are patterns of thinking and ways of doing things that we as parents can teach our children, that they in turn can teach their own children, that it's part of the value system that we can lean into as a family and as a community. Let me just first speak to what am I talking about when I'm talking about resilience for the purposes of our conversation today. This is not a definition you're going to find in Wikipedia. This is a definition you're going to find on the Impact Podcast because it's mine and I I get to do that. But when I talk about resilience, I am not simply referring to resilience in the context of mental health. I'm also talking about resilience in the context of our physical health. You've heard me do a few different podcasts talking all about COVID and the pandemic. And what's so interesting 
when we speak to physicians like Dr. Kira Menting, who's running an ICU in Ottawa, and we say, what are the features of those individuals who are faring most poorly in the face of COVID? It is unequivocal for him that it is those who lack physiological resilience, those whose blood pressure is off the charts, those who have an incapacity to stabilize their blood sugar. Resilience is actually not just the mental health piece. It is a spectrum. It's how we set our physiology and our psychology up for success. And that means we challenge the system. That means that we give ourselves a fighting chance. That means if we've got trauma, we work through it. You're going to hear over the course of the series from a number of experts who bring up trauma, who talk about trauma, managing your trauma. And trauma does not have to be like massive and catastrophic. Trauma can just be you're in the wrong place at the wrong time with like the wrong physiological state. You could be stressed out for your for your high school exams and witness a traffic accident or be in a simple traffic accident. And that can be a traumatic event for you. So it is not for us to judge other people's trauma or challenges, but we do need to talk about how we set ourselves up for success, us as individuals, but also us as parents. You know, when we send our kids off to school, and I'm trying not to be judgmental, I'm just speaking to the notion of physiological resilience, what you feed your kids for lunch matters. Not giving them excessive amounts of sugar matters because that's how we start to build up their physiological resilience. Facilitating and making exercise fun matters because that's how we build up and maintain physiological resilience. Not eating food out of packages when we can matters because that's how we build up that physiological resilience. And physiological resilience is a precursor to that mental health resilience. That space that authorizes us to take action in our lives. If our physiology doesn't have our back, it doesn't matter how much positive psychology you throw at the table. The system cannot support the event. So I think it's really important that when we talk about this notion of resilience, that there is a clear working definition that I'm not just talking about the mental health piece. I'm also talking about that physical health piece and developing resilience is not something we are necessarily born with. We may have a genetic predisposition to not fly off the physiological handle in the face of anxiety and stress, but that is simply a predisposition. How that gets parented and how that pathway gets exercised is actually how that resilience gets to manifest. My point here is that you get to control this. And for some of you, that's going to be disappointing. And for others, that's going to provide you with hope. But this is just true to life in general. Resilience, like with confidence, is not something you're ever handed. You can't buy your way to that degree. You can't donate enough money to that university. You have to earn it. And you earn it in the dark on your own. You earn it by closing the refrigerator and picking something smarter. You earn it by sitting in a state of discomfort and having conversations around your boundaries. Resilience is something you earn. Let's rewind. Let's talk a little bit about my my own journey with resilience. I will say, and I know because I've run my genetics, I've talked about this. I know that I have a predisposition to remaining calm in a state of crisis. And if you didn't know you could determine these things from your genetics, you can, which is actually super cool. It doesn't mean I always stay calm in the state of crisis. It doesn't mean I stay calm when my kids are losing their whatever in the evening after I've had a long day. Megan is far from perfect. I, like I laugh because it's like, it, it, that's just that's just the truth. I, I We all have our moments, right? But I do have this propensity and capacity to view the glass half full. I made a decision early on in my life. And here, and I'll tell you a little bit about the story in a second. But like when I would spend time in my car growing up, and I spent a lot of time in my car growing up, I was always fascinated by ideas. Ideas get me super excited. It's why I like reading nonfiction. It's like candy for my, for my brain. But when I would spend a lot of time in uh, my car by myself, I would go to the library and I would take out cassette tapes, uh, like personal development 
uh, teachers or Tony Robbins or something like this. And I, I was exposed to ideas at a really impressionable part of, of my growing up around the fact that we make choices around how we want to view certain situations and we, we get to make those choices and those decisions. And so I remember hearing Tony Robbins talk about this idea of, well, what else could it mean? And that was a really empowering question that I encountered young in my age. And so I practiced and tried on that question in my life when something would happen to me. Well, what else could this mean? Is there a different lesson here that could be learned? Sure. Sometimes it was just shit. Like it was just a shitty situation and it was really hard to draw meaning to it. But I started to ask myself that question. Sometimes I wasn't ready to hear it. Sometimes I wasn't ready to answer that. Sometimes I just needed someone to witness my pain. I also realized in asking that question, what else could this mean? Or maybe it means something else. That's a question that you yourself get to ask yourself. It's not a question that usually is well-received being projected onto others. This is where that self-work comes in. And so this was a question I was exposed to early on. And I practiced asking myself this question. Sometimes I embraced it and sometimes it didn't. The thing that's really important to know about how I developed resilience is that when I was young, my parents got divorced. I was an only child from their marriage. My mom lived four hours away from my dad. And when I was very young, they had joint custody. I would live with one parent for two years, and then I would live with the next parent for two years. And every other week I was driven back and forth. I spent a lot of time in a car and I could see and feel the pain on my parents' faces when I would move in and out of their lives. As a parent now, I can only imagine the pain that they felt and how much effort it took for them to maintain their composure, which they didn't always do. But for a young and rightfully so, but for a young kid, that was a that was a lot to witness. And for an empathetic kid, that was a lot to witness. And so what I needed to learn how to do at a young age was manage that degree of emotionality, find boundaries in my own responsibility for my parents' emotional state. I decided early on that their their getting divorced was not my fault. I know some kids own that. That part didn't make sense to me. I was like that's an adult that was an, that's an adult thing that that is that isn't mine that I'm going to choose uh to own. But what I was owning and still continue to own to some degree is responsibility for their emotional health because I knew I could directly control that. And fast forward, I went from driving back and forth to then I still went back and forth. I went to seven different schools before I started high school. I was flown back and forth every two weeks to see my parents because it was more efficient for them. It was way, it was way less driving. And I was alone by myself in these big airports. And I've told this story uh, before, but will not make the presumption that you've listened to every last podcast. I hated being an unaccompanied minor on the plane. And I realized, like, really hated it. Um, You'd wear this big pouch around your neck or this big stupid button. And you just, like, you just felt like such, like, to use 80s language, you just felt like such a dork on the plane. Like, it was was so poorly thought out by some man without a child in an office somewhere, um, probably some lawyer who was mitigating response or liability. Notwithstanding that piece, this was, this was like a major source of, like, coming to age and uh, embarrassment and rebellion. And so what I realized is if I took off that pouch early on, while all the stewardesses or stewards or flight attendants were busy, I could hide that pouch in my bag. They weren't really noticing. And I would usually talk up the business traveler next to me, which 99% of the time was a man. And what I realized would happen with the flight attendants is they would think that he was my dad. Uh, and I was his kid, and I could just march off the plane with all of the other uh, all of the other passengers. Now, I, as an adult, really don't like getting in trouble, but also loathe the rules. So I'm kind of surprised looking back that I did this as a kid, but I would just always get off the plane with all of the other passengers. And at this point, was known enough that by that because it was always the same flight teams back and forth, that they kind of turned a blind eye to this. Now, I was like 10, 11, 12 years old. 
So I would get on the plane and I would be holding space for that, uh, that emotional discomfort of losing my parents. I'd say bye to my mom or dad. I had this routine that like, once I said goodbye and I turned to walk towards the plane, I didn't turn back. The turning back piece I knew would be a trigger for me. But if I just continued to walk forward, I knew it was a safe space. And if I walked forward and then got on that plane and then took off my big dumb button, I was like in a state of freedom and independence I had never felt in my life. To this day, one of my happiest places to be is in an airport getting onto a plane. It triggers all of those emotions of responsibility and resilience and independence and and all of those pieces. But I also know that this pattern of like just turning and walking forward and being able to move on to the next thing, that was part of my coping mechanism. And it's part of the coping mechanism that I've carried into adulthood. Now I've unpacked a lot of the a lot of the the trauma and and deep emotional pieces associated with that travel back and forth and with my parents' divorce and with owning that element of emotional responsibility uh, for their situation, not entirely because we're human, but as as to the best of my ability. But what I realize now as an adult is that that experience afforded me access to an inner state of resilience that I f- like I can't imagine how else I would have acquired it. And what's interesting is that when we have conversations related to uh, privilege, I I acknowledge that I have had access to things in my life that have afforded me a tremendous amount of privilege. But nothing has afforded me more privilege than accessing emotional resilience and experiencing and witnessing evidence of my own capacity at a young age. That, more than anything else, is my unfair advantage. That I learned young to rely on myself. That when the going gets tough, that I had tools and ways and mechanisms to be able to continue to move forward. As an adult, and as I had my own children, and as I unpacked and managed some of the emotional pieces and recognized patterns where, where that resilience was resulting in unhelpful patterns, it actually deepened my capacity. Because a huge part of establishing resilience and stress resilience is also ensuring adequate recovery. See, suppression of emotions does not mean you are a resilient person. I'm going to say this one more time for those of you in the back. Suppressing your emotions and being able to maintain a stiff upper lip is fake resilience. Because you're going to hit a wall. You're likely going to hit a wall on your health. The clinician in me is going to let you know that. You need to be aware of it. When you just shove those emotions deep down inside, the body hangs on to them. Resilience is a partnership between your physiological health and your mental emotional health. And when you sacrifice your body for the state of your mental emotional health, your body will fall apart. We are only human. And when we sacrifice our mental emotional resilience for physiological capacity, we also eventually hit a wall. And this is where the secret work comes in because no one knows what's happening behind the doors of your life. No one else can do this work for you. It's up to you to acknowledge the relationship and how you are doing on both sides. Natalie Jill talked about this. She talked a lot about this idea of circumstances. And, you know, I want to build off of that conversation as a clinician. It is easy for us as people to blame our circumstances and opt out of the tools that are available to us. We do this thing where we over-index our own circumstances and we underestimate others because we're not feeling them. We're not in their soup. The one thing I can share with you as a clinician, and I think is one of the most powerful lessons I took away from the, the clinical era of my career, is that lots of people, most people, have lots of shit you don't know about. People have lost parents traumatically at a young age. People you wouldn't expect have been emotionally or sexually abused. Adults who seem to have it all together are being bullied every single day at work. Women 
who can hold space and articulate their final arguments as litigators in an unrivaled capacity in their career may have had a miscarriage that morning. We really don't know what happens behind closed doors of those around us. And assuming that we do, and guessing that our circumstances are somehow different, dismisses us from accessing the lessons of resilience that are available around us. I share this not because I want anyone to feel any level of shame. I'm sharing this because I want to start to normalize the fact that life is hard, that an easy life is actually an exception, that that family down the street that has all of that money may or may not have a whole slew of other things happening behind closed doors. Developing your own resilience is a precursor to being able to develop it in your kids. We all deserve an opportunity to develop resilience in our lives because it is a tool that will enable us to self-actualize. In the absence of resilience, we cannot live up to our truest potential because we are always mitigating and protecting and boundering feelings that we don't know how to deal with. I have found so far, people talked about this all the time. They're like, little people, little problems, big people, big problems. It's exhausting having small children. And some people are going through hard things with their small children. And then as they get older, wow, this notion of big kids, big problems, that's a whole other piece. When my daughter was was disqualified at her swim meet a few weeks ago, I've talked about this a few times because I was like, this is one of the first like real like owning emotional moments I had as a parent. I was devastated for her. Like I could just feel how much pain she was. She was in a relay. So she had teammates and she didn't, she didn't mean to, like she didn't mean to miss the wall on her turn. And this was her first swim meet and all the things devastated, devastated about what that meant for them. I also knew in that moment, as nice as it would have been for her to share that gold medal with her teammates, learning how to manage her emotions, understanding and being able to step in empathetically when one of them defaults in the future. These are life lessons she's never going to lose. We're never going to take those away. And gosh, it was so hard as a parent. I would have given anything to try to take that away from her, that pain that she was feeling. But I could also see in that moment, and I can see a few weeks later when the initial shock and physiology, because it's a physiological cascade that gets triggered when we're that disappointed, when that dissipated, when that biochemistry wore out, the lesson remained. And so here, here is my call to action for all of you as you sit with me in this series on resilience. My question and call to action for you is what and where in your life do you need to lean in on that resilience piece, on that physiological resilience, on that psychological resilience? What trauma would you benefit from unpacking? so that you can step into the shoes that you need to step into to be the leader, to be the parent, to be the community member, to be the spouse, to be the employee, to be the boss, that you have the capacity to be. The last two years have been hard, like really hard, like head blow up, fly off the gasket, kind of hard. Some of us, it was hard early. For some of us, it was hard later. We all had different experiences we were bringing to the table, but no one was immune to the hardness. But on the backside of it, as we start to emerge from this era, there's also a tremendous capacity for us to integrate that trauma. There's a tremendous capacity for us to pat ourselves on the back and witness what we are made of. And that's my wish for all of you in this series, not for it to be dark and gloomy, but for it to actually be a beacon of light, for you to be a beacon of light in your own life and for those people around you. Because when you do that, that is when you can step into your maximum state of impact. 
So that's what we're doing. We're hanging out. We're talking about resilience over the course of the next few weeks. And then we're going to get into a series on kids. Why? So we can pass these lessons down. So we can have the impact that we dreamed of having in this world. If this episode resonated with you or you know someone with whom it might resonate, I would love it if you could pass it on. If you enjoyed hanging out today, if you would be so kind as to leave a review wherever you subscribe to podcasts, that's what enables us to reach more people. That is what will enable us to have more impact. I'm Megan Walker, and I will be with you again next week. Impact is what lives on when we leave the room, tuck them in, or step off stage. It is less about what you do, more about how you make them feel, and everything about how you choose to show up in the world. If you enjoyed this podcast, hit subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you are listening to this episode. I am your host, Megan Walker. Until next week, aim for impact.